Now, for the second part of our program, we start off with diversity and inclusion. And I am so happy, man. Um, I, I, I've had an absolute distinct privilege of working with our next speaker for the last several couple of years. Um, George Burrell is from Philadelphia. He's a graduate of the University of Penn. He was one of those elite athletes uh, who made it to the NFL. Um, George was a defensive back in a kickoff return. In fact, one of my favorite stories, man, he told me, George told me that he was briefly in the record books. Um, he had a game down at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, he got this kickoff return. I think he ran 98 yards back on touchdown. The longest anybody ever ran for a touchdown in the Ivy League history. And George was in the record books, finally in the record books. Well, at the, during the next kickoff, he, they kicked the ball off. The guy on the opposite team got the ball. He was about 103 yards, I think he said, in the end zone. And he ran it back and broke George's record. <laughs> so, so, so George was in the record books for about, for about, a, about a minute. <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, George, uh, uh, his talents uh, spoke for himself. The Denver Broncos had a head rise on them. And they drafted George. And George went out to Denver and became the starting cornerback for the Denver Broncos. And you know, elite athletes, man, they always, they, they have it good. I mean, sometimes there's no need to go back and reach back and give back. You know, but George is different. Not only did he didn't reach back and give back, he went back down to, uh, down to Philadelphia um, and did some incredible work. Yeah, he ran for mayor, uh, he was a city councilman. Um, he was a deputy mayor. Um, he's on the forefront of any change that's happening in Philadelphia right now. If there's any significant change attached to it, you could almost count the Jewel Burrell name is not in. Um, he's on the governor's council for diversity and inclusion and small business opportunity. He's not just on the council, he drives the council. He makes everyone accountable. He makes sure that a guy like me get the resources that I need to do my job. George Burrell is one of those mentors that everyone should have. Nothing is going to excite him. Nothing is going to make him afraid. He understands the fullness of our issues. And he has the longevity to stand and fight for what is right. You have his Bible in your packets. You can read that extensively. What I want to do is maximize my time and maximize his time sharing with you. I'd like to bring to the podium Mr. George Moreno. If you don't laugh at my joke, I'm going to take my time. <laughs> I love this story, though, because most of it's true. Long time ago, I promised my daughter that we would spend, my daughter's 44, she was 11 when this happened. I promised my daughter that we would spend the day together. It was a Sunday. So we went to church. We got to church at 10 o'clock. My minister, Bill Gray, had been overseas and came back telling all kinds of stories. But we didn't get out to one. But that day I had promised my mother we would come to our, her church where she was mistress of ceremonies for a Women's Day program. We got there at 2.30 for devotionals, and at 4.30 in the afternoon, the speaker of the day had not gotten up to speak. Well, you can imagine my 11-year-old was running out of patience. So she started moving around, and I said, Leslie, please just a little while longer, and I'll get you home, you'll be cool. And she looked up and she said, okay, Dad, and she saw these pictures on the wall of the church. She said, tell me who they are and I will be quiet. And I, I looked at her and I said, Les, those are 
permitted, this is during the Vietnam War, said those are, men, those are memorials to men and women who died in the service. And she looked up at me and she said, Daddy, which service, morning or afternoon? <laughs> this great commercial, Western Savings Bank, that said, uh, wishing won't do it, savings will. And I think that's a direction that we, as an African-American community, have to take to heart and say the status quo won't do it, and change is imperative. And that change is our responsibility. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, I cannot hear the words that you speak, or the thunder of what you are rings too loudly in my ears. An overstatement of African-American reality? Maybe. But it accurately reflects the attitude of African-Americans not voting. Donald Trump is the poster child for political aversion to the truth. But Americans generally believe all politicians lie or intentionally exaggerate the truth. Democrats, George Bush lied about weapons of mass destruction. <coughs> Republicans, Barack Obama, lied about keeping your DACA. Did they lie or did they make mistakes? But not trusting leaders breaks with African-American tradition, a trust born out of the revolutionary accomplishments of Rosa, Martin, Malcolm, Fannie Lou, Thurgood, Angela, and others. Role models not expecting recognition for doing the right thing, not seeking fame or fortune. Leaders who stared down presidents and Jim Crow. Leaders who understood that we shall overcome required transformative change, not symbolic victories for African American first. If I could help somebody along the way, yeah. then my living shall not be in vain. It's a song of faith calling us to raise our children in churches and mosques, be good neighbors, extend a helping hand to strangers. But acts of love and kindness will not pave the road to the American dream in 2018. The Civil Rights Movement, though, left a, pres a prescription for leaders and community working in tandem. The Montgomery Boycott, Brown versus Board of Education, the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, but there was also pain. Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Denise McNair, 1963 victims of the Birmingham bombing, and Schroener Goodman and Merck Taney, murdered in Mississippi in 1964. It is astounding that the same hatred that took those lives 50 years ago drove Dylan Roof to murder nine worshipers in Charlotte, North Carolina, South Carolina in 2015. But through the joy and pain, civil rights leaders spoke truth to power, forced Goliath to concede generations of protected turf, transcended ego, personality, and strategy differences despite periodic harsh words and hard feelings. They transcended ego, personality, and strategy differences, despite periodic harsh words and hard feelings, a lesson we should all learn today, and delivered transformative change to African Americans, whether you were in the trenches or on the sidelines. They did not pick winners and losers. When those extraordinary leaders passed the baton, they assumed economic and political power would be achieved and the dream realized. They were right about the power. Three mayors in Philadelphia, two majority whips in the United States Congress, and a president of the United States. But progress has been pedestrian and economic power elusive. What happened, or as Dustin Hoffman asked in the graduate, where have you gone, Mrs. Robbins? What's next? First, African-American leaders will not be architects of transformative change unless we form cooperating gangs that mirror Abraham Lincoln's team of rivals. 
The Tea Party is again. Evangelicals are again. Fox News and right-wing media are again. Together, they are transforming America to the, to the detriment of African Americans by openly, openly promoting racism, endorsing extremists, and flaunting power. Think about it. John Boehner and Paul Ryan <coughs> surrendered congressional power to gangs that did not exist 20 years ago. I am, I am confident that God has a plan for each of our lives. That, that that plan gives us the free will to work as hard for our community as we do for sororities, fraternities, and social clubs. To care about something more than me and mom. To respond when Colin Kaepernick gets blackballed because he is a man of courage and conviction. Because NFL owners care more about the bottom line than the American dream. But imagine bigots reaching for remote controls when Colin Kaepernick's believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, Nike commercial fills their screens. But I hope that all of us will support Nike just as the haters have become, begun to boycott. Because they're not boycotting Nike, they're protesting us. <laughs> Colin Kaepernick and Black Lives Matter Remind, remind us that conversations about race and symbolic victories like removing statutes and flags, though important, <coughs> are not solutions to paralyzing threats like Ferguson, Baltimore, poverty, affordable health care. Solutions require African American leaders, coupled with engaged citizens, re envisioning or remembering how civil rights staying power was achieved and consequences imposed. Today's enemies recognize our staying power as a weakness. Because we move from, from storm to storm, they patiently let the storms pass. Philadelphians were outraged when Philadelphia Magazine published an, act, an, an inaccurate and offensive article being white and filthy. But six months later, friends had returned to social interactions with the magazine publisher as though nothing had happened. Second, since the Civil Rights Movement, African American power has shifted <coughs> to elected officials. Smart, talented, and dedicated. But too often operating in clips, focusing on districts, not the African American community at large, and re the re-elections. They are influenced by campaign contributions, and leadership votes from non-African Americans. Although they are needed in power, there also is a need for, it, for leadership with a blueprint for change at scale. In Toni Morrison's book, Song of Solomon, she concluded, African -Ameri concluded Americans confuse change with exchange. New people in power make the same decisions but select a new set of beneficiaries and call it change. Forty years ago, Philadelphia African American candidates, including me, promised change if elected. The community responded, and I'm sure this community has also, with coffee clatches, casino nights, fish fries, petition drives, motorcades, and changed the Philadelphia political landscape. Those volunteers who sacrificed time and resources deserved a greater return than 40 years of treading water, waiting in vain, or worse, waiting for Godot. If the well is dry, why keep going back? Although I believe in the importance of voting, those in office have the duty to demonstrate it makes a difference. My fear is that unless we transcend cliques and egos, establish a peer relationship between public and private sector leaders with women, millennials, and the LGBT community at the table, develop an agenda focused on progress for African Americans across the economic spectrum, not just those of us and our children already positioned. African American prospects more likely will mirror the Cleveland Browns 
than the Philadelphia Eagles or Pittsburgh Steelers. In this commonwealth, we are blessed with elected, religious, labor, civic, LGBTQ, and business leaders available to provide co coordinated and outcome-focused leadership. But someone or someones must step forward to convene that gang for more than one meeting and more than one issue. Diversity also has created a, created a deep bench of private sector African Americans with the ability to be difference makers, appointed officials, leaders of school districts and housing authorities, chairs and executives of quasi-governmental agencies, nonprofits, co non colleges, universities, community colleges, healthcare institutions, and executives in the private sector. But their contributions will be determined by the decisions they make and the discretion they exercise. African-American leadership organizations and media must become more than service organizations and reporters. Corporations needing support from African-American elected officials and the purchasing power of our community must be held accountable for more than sprinkling contributions to build brand and image. Companies measuring revenue in billions are rewarded for sharing millions in contracting and charitable contributions, only a modest percentage of which gets deposited by African-American organizations and businesses. Don't get me wrong, growing African-American businesses and creating wealth is important, but it is equally important that successful businesses spend with, spend with other African-American businesses and professionals and create neighborhood-based jobs. Joanne Bell, who you'll meet later on, and my friends at PRWT, the largest African-American-owned business in Philadelphia, is a good role model. African-Americans are the largest minority population in Pennsylvania and most loyal Democrats. It is unfortunate we did not vote in large enough numbers to win Pennsylvania with Hillary Clinton. But Democrats should confront African-American issues as targeted priorities and stop telling us that a rising tide lifts all boats. Students in failing schools, working families living in poverty, African-Americans addicted to heroin before opioids became a mainstream crisis, and families devastated by homicides at the hands of officers sworn to protect them are not in boats. They live in the water with a fear of drowning. Philadelphia, 26% poverty, too many illiterate adults, treading water while non-Philadelphians work and create wealth during a current building boom. Democrats, though, will not do better as long as we let the storms pass. The gangs aligned against African Americans also assert the playing field has been leveled. We are living in post-racial America. But there is a God who sits high and looks low. There is, emerging, there is an emerging generation of talented young leaders who I pray are prepared to take risks, coalesce around a transformative agenda, work as a team of rivals. But as their leadership matures, the rest of us, individually and collectively, individually and collectively, now I've lost my place, individually and collectively, <laughs> must confront the unacceptable behavior in our neighborhoods, support African-American businesses, respect our honest differences, respect each other's faith and beliefs, and we must put our collective oars in the water, prepare to embrace friends and confront enemies, because again, quoting Emerson, without ambition, one starts with nothing. Without work, one finishes nothing. The prize will not be sent to you. You have to win it. African-American leaders have position and power. Ambition is not a problem. Leaders now must lead with courage. We must follow with conviction. And together, we must win, not win. Thank you.